so, do you realize that each one of you here is precious, unique, and loved? Do you in fact know that you are in reality rich and that you live in abundance? Some of you are perhaps going to say, how can you state that? I don't feel that way at all. But I can assure you and would like to show you that even so it's true. Nothing and nobody can change that. How can each one of you also experience this and arrive at this conclusion? I'd like to show you today how you can have this feeling of being loved and to have the inner conviction that you are precious and unique. And so you can experience abundance. The next question that suggests itself is, who is responsible for my happiness, my worth, and for this love? You all know the tendency of some people to think that whatever happens in our life is due to something else, something out there. Many people believe that they are the victims of circumstances over which they have no control, whether it is family circumstances, working conditions, or world conditions. You could certainly name a few more. But there is a way out of the dilemma. We can be free from the burdens and instabilities that we run into. Not for sure on the basis of our own casual decisions, but of the practical basis of understanding our spiritual identity and individuality and their source and origin. Jesus assured us of this source and its results when he said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And the Bible also says, Honor and majesty hast thou laid upon him. I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Riches and honor are with me, yea, durable richness and righteousness, that I may cause those that I love me to inherit substance, and I will fill their treasurer. Treasurers. And Mary Baker Eddy, the discoverer of Christian Science, also explained in her book, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, it's on page 201, the superabundance of being is on the side of God, good. The superabundance. Not a little fullness, not just barely enough to pay all the bills, rather a superabundance of good. There are infinite blessings, superabundance for all of us, an abundance of spiritual ideas that supply us with everything that we need every day in this very moment. Who promise us these blessings, this abundance? It is the divine influence in human consciousness that communicates the right to have complete supply and also maintains that right. Through Christian science, we begin to understand that the divine influence is the Christ, not in the person of Jesus, but as a true idea of God, which Jesus embodied, and which reveals the truth about each individual's relationship to God. 
and the message of the Christ, of this divine influence, is that everyone here is infinitely loved, precious, and unique. You see, yesterday I had another lecture and I made always this sign and a lot of people talk with me about this today and uh, it's always the same. But we really have to listen to our understanding, this connection, it's always there to this one source. But how do we reach this source and this abundance? Let's consider these ideas. Usually people reason from a standpoint of lack. There seems to be a lack of everything, lack of strength, lack of companionship, lack of joy and love, lack of freshness and enthusiasm, lack of work, of money, of health. It seems as if behind every problem of this world there's a sort of lack. However, we just heard about the promised abundance, the exact opposite of lack. Abundance of love, health, work, freshness, enthusiasm. In order to experience the opposite of lack in our experience, Jesus advised us of something very important. You know, I didn't read the Bible before I read and start this book. So, for me, the Bible is not something about a denomination. It's really about freedom, you see, but we have to look behind the words. It's not a dramatic way, it's really, yeah? It's about freedom. And this is very important when I'm going on here. So, he said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So, seek ye first the kingdom of God God, this is the kingdom, this, yeah, this connection here, and not this connection. And as we all know, Jesus himself never lacked anything. He lived in abundance and riches, riches of spirit, not of things. He drew directly from the divine source and shared with others what we had because he was very conscious of being one with the Christ, with the divine influence. Each one of us has access to this source. It comes from our permanent unity with God, with spirit. We are always inseparable in unity with this source. We only need to look for it and admit this. Recently I was traveling by train and as the scenery was passing before my eyes, the thought came into my head how different everything looks when viewed from a different standpoint. And this impression is especially strong when one travels by plane. So can a change of standpoint influence our experience? Absolutely. We all know the saying, to see something with different eyes. Naturally, this doesn't merely mean an outward change that is physically perceptible, but rather a spiritual and mental process to some extent a change in consciousness. Is it then possible that by changing our standpoint we can experience this promised abundance with everything that belongs to it. How can we reach this change of consciousness? This change of consciousness from here to there. You see, there are a lot of walls. Mere human wanting, theoretical, ideological thinking, as experience has shown, will hardly be able to help us overcome our own limitations and the standpoint of lack. Normally, 
we start from the concept that we feel and think according to something we perceive as being out there. Christian science, however, explains that it's exactly the other way around. We experience what we think. If we let our thoughts and feelings conform to the general view of things, which is modeled on lack, limitations, then we were carried away and influenced by that. Our experience will then more closely resemble the gloomy color of lack. We started to be afraid and to be subject to these circumstances. And at the same time, we then try to improve ourselves on this basis. We work hard to be able to acquire things and we make useless efforts to find love in our lives. In Christian science, we learn that God is a loving father-mother. And when we trust him or her as a source of abundance, we are relieved of the burden of depressing thoughts and events. We begin to see things from a different and new starting point. Then we begin to free ourselves from fear. We gain new direction. Our human thinking needs help, a help that comes from this new different starting point. It mean, I mean divine help, a divinely inspired standpoint. How do we go from a standpoint that is limited by human conditions and enjoy an inspired standpoint that helps us onward in practical ways. Let me illustrate this by telling an experience of a friend who one day asked me for help. She told me that she felt unloved and totally worthless. Besides, she had been suffering from severe rheumatism and intense pains for 30 years, for which she'd been taking up to 30 pills daily, and which pretty much left her unable to think clearly. So it was almost impossible for her to get a job. And her mother, whom she had cared for and nursed and with whom she had lived for a long time, had just died. So she also felt helpless and alone. Then she had to move to another place, and so she had to go to a different medical doctor. After half a year, he turned the conversation to Christian science, a method that involves healing through scientific prayer, he told her. The doctor thought it would help her. She was somewhat familiar with this book, Science and Health, with key to the scripture. She had read and studied it before. In our prayer, we began to reverse the standpoint of her thinking and so to heal her feelings. First, we expanded her very limited perspective by explaining divine absolute promises, assurances, and standpoints as we have been talking about. In doing this, we looked at Psalm 91 in the Bible and I helped her to apply these ideas to herself. In this psalm, we have this promise. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. It continues, his truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the error that flees by day. They shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Mm. 
I like this. There's always an angel with you. Do you realize this? Ah, oh, there are some, okay. It applied directly to her situation and her need to change her inner attitude and to acknowledge trustfully in a childlike way that she was under the shadow, the loving care and protection of the Most High and always had been. We talked about how we learn in Christian science that God is infinite truth, infinite life, and infinite love, and that he gives only what would be a complete blessing to his creation, and that included her. That's why it's so important to make the decision of seeking first the kingdom of God. The Bible says that man was made in the image and likeness of God, in the image and likeness of love, in the image and likeness of soul, in the image and likeness of spirit. That's you, not only me, you too, in the image and likeness of love. Therefore, man is God's reflection, and as God's reflection, my friend was constantly receiving spiritually bestowed blessings and ideas that would bring health and harmony into her life. In order to be under the shadow of the Almighty and to enjoy this state of consciousness that guarantees happiness, love, peace, the abundance of supply and security, our thoughts need to be enlightened and purified. And we talked about the fact that the more she could realize this, the more she would be able to see where the abundance comes from. And we talked about the fact that at the same time she would arrive at the spiritual understanding that would enable her to overcome lag. Little by little, she got used to this standpoint of abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. She visibly woke up from the depressing feeling that she lacked something and was not loved. Sometimes she tell me with amazement, I know I am really loved. This is unbelievable. I never thought I could really feel such a thing. Every time she had this glimpse, the fog, so to speak, lifted and her physical problems also improved immediately. So when you feel this, you know, these walls are coming down more and more and you see more and better opportunities. At the same time, that she began to apply for various job openings. She moved to another city, but not every job she tried turned out to be her permanent workplace. Sometimes that made her feel insecure and she continued to strive to stop accepting her limited views regarding lack of employment or lack of companionship. She gradually accepted the standpoint of being under the shadow of the Almighty under the shadow of the love, in spite of some disappointments. To be under the shadow of the Almighty is to experience our spiritual status as God's image and likeness, our spiritual identity and individuality fully supplied with everything in every moment. But we have to listen to this and to give our consent you see, we give the whole day our consent to lack, to problems. I didn't learn to start from perfection in my thinking. It was normal to solve a problem. But now I understand it's totally around. You know, I really start from perfection in my thinking the whole time. 
And this is where we have to train a little bit. And this book helps a lot in this way. Through the spiritual work we were doing, she gradually had the conviction and really felt that neither she nor her happiness depended on outward circumstances. She realized and felt that it wasn't necessary to constantly compare herself with others and thus feel worthless. She began to have a sense of security and love and gained confidence to approach new paths and challenges. She began to recognize that God was always close to her. In this context, we started talking about the subject of trusting an invisible God and to know that he guides everything and gives us the ideas we need. What does it mean to trust God? Trust, according to one dictionary, means unconditional reliance on someone. You see, like a child to the mother. She needed to have that kind of trust to do this unconditionally implied giving up all personal notions and to put all trust in this one God and this one soul and this one love. What is God that makes people want to trust him unconditionally? Science and Health answers this question, what is God on page 465? God is incorporeal, divine, supreme, infinite mind, spirit, soul, principle, life, truth, love. Supreme and infinite mean that God is unlimited, the only power and the highest power there is. Incorporeal and divine mean that God is self-existent, not dependent on physical conditions. God is perfect, intelligence, substantial, reliable, all-powerful, intelligent love, divine life. Isn't that something that all of us would like to rely on? But how do you do this? You may agree with me that a pure childlike trust in God is far superior to the most cleverly conceived human plans and calculations. Some of you will already have experienced that, at least as a child. But you may be asking yourself, where can I find this trust in God? Sometimes Deep in our hearts, we would like to be childlike and free from prejudgment. Childlike qualities such as purity and innocence are the foundation of a capacity to trust in God without fear. Maybe some of you learned to pray when you were children, that is to trust yourself to a loving Father, Mother God, Sometimes, unfortunately, people lose this child faith. Now, why is that? Do we have access to God only as children? And what happens when we grow up? We can't trust God, love, spirit anymore? Certainly, a lot of people think that to trust God is naive or childish. And also, many people think the prayer is ineffective and not acceptable for adults. Don't we have to adopt such views? There's been a more open attitude in the public consciousness towards prayer, especially recently. It was intensively discussed and debated at a conference in my hometown, Hamburg, with the title, Prayer and Science. And the in Germany well-known Professor Dürr, runner-up for the Nobel Peace Prize and 
fellow at the Max Planck Institute said in the opening speech, it's very interesting, as a physicist, I've spent my whole research life asking what's behind matter. The end result is very simple. There is no matter. Modern science makes the first link possible between the various science and the religions of the world. In this we are helped by prayer to change how we view things and to reach a different state of consciousness. In answer to the question as to whether he himself prayed, he answered essentially, if by prayer you are not referring to clasp hands, but rather to an open, receptive attitude, then he would say he too prays. Prayer has an individual and culturally deep and weighty meaning, independent of denomination. End of the quote. Isn't that exciting? Physicists pray they put their knowledge to one side and open themselves in a childlike way to God. You see then that a childlike trust in this God, as Jesus taught, is not at all a childish thing. And prayer that is anchored in such trust can be effective in a visible way, as Jesus' works clearly prove. The Bible also speaks of our being as the children of God. This describes in a unique way not only the actual spiritual nature of man who is of divine origin, but also a loving, even a tender relationship with God as between parents and children. God relates to us and through the Christ, the divine influence, he always has something to impart to us. But let's go back to my friend. She wanted to turn to God with this childlike trust, with an open and receptive attitude, and she began to put everything in the hands of God, the all-powerful, intelligent love, and to listen more and more for his ideas. I supported her in this through prayer. Then one day she came to me full of joy and told me that she had been offered a new job that completed suited her. She felt that this was an answer to all her searchings and praying. And in her new position, she was able to share precisely those things that she had been learning of love and of new experiences and she was able to live comfortably with the salary. As a side effect, so to speak, of our spiritual work and her childlike trust in divine love, the rheumatism and pain disappeared and she was completely free of having to take up to 30 pills every day as she had to decades. She no longer takes any pills and is healthier than ever before. But it was a big shift, I can tell you. We have to knock on these walls. Yeah, that is coming down. Because so you can't see the whole world, the life. It's only in this way. And be not afraid that the walls are coming down. It's good, I can tell you. It's my own experience. It's wonderful. In addition, unlike her earlier tendencies to give up and quit as soon as she encountered difficult experiences, she now consistently held to the previously mentioned divine promises. I repeat, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And in science and health, the superabundance of being is on the side of God, good. The superabundance. I want more from this, you see. Mary Baker Eddy, 
who wrote that sentence is the discoverer and founder of Christian science and from childhood had that childlike trust in a God who only loves, who only loves. In spite of this childlike trust in a loving God, her life was marked by illness and problems for a time. But she continued to trust in this loving God and was convinced that she would eventually find solutions for her challenges in her own life. She writes, From my very childhood I was impelled by a hunger and thirst after divine things, a desire for something higher and better than matter, and apart from it. I learned from this often, I said, matter doesn't matter. See, so her search was successful. Through her searchings and longing, the light of the Christ power came more and more to the surface of Mary Baker Eddy's inspired thought. And in 1866, she experienced how the understanding of God's constant presence and the constant unity of man to him as his image and likeness leads to healing. She was healed through it without material aid of the effects of a severe accident. And this healing marked her discovery of Christian science. Her path after that was not always easy. She lived modestly in rented rooms and was given room and board in ex exchange for her teachings and for healing people. But some landlords did not approve of her teachings and often asked her to leave. She had to move several times in a year. More than once she went on foot from one boarding house to the next, alone and without friends. But she knew and felt inside that she could never really be separated from divine love and that all challenges that confronted her would not turn her from her path. <clears throat> After her discovery, she healed many people on the basis of Christian science and she began to experience a superabundance of divine love in everything she did. She became not only a successful healer, but also a publisher and a founder of a metaphysical college and a church. Now for you to experience the abundance of practical and applicable divine laws, there must be a decisive shift of values from a material to a spiritual basis. More and more we need to adjust to this way of thinking, to listen to divine ideas and then follow them with childlike trust. A passage in Science and Health says it in this way, it's on 506. I really love this one. Spirit, God, gathers unformed thoughts into their proper channels and unfolds these thoughts even as he opens the petals of a holy purpose in order that the purpose may appear. Well, it's beautiful, huh? Let me illustrate this unfolding of divine thoughts and childlike trust. Let me share another friend's experience. She's a student of Christian science and after she left her hometown to try living someplace else, she felt a strong inner impulse to return home again. And she urgently also needed an uh, apartment or house for herself and her two cats. So she called me one day to ask for prayerful support. She went looking for a suitable place to live, but in spite of some offers, she at first didn't find anything appropriate. Everything was either too far away or too expensive. Then she found a little house for sale. The conversation with the seller was cordial and open, and my friend felt that everything with the seller was going very harmoniously and free from friction 
the way it should when the Christ light shines on the heart. She had no doubts, and so she decided to buy the house. She told her family of her plans and talked about a loan from her bank. But because her income was very, not very high at that time, she was worried as to whether the bank would to approve a loan anyway. We recall that God's thoughts are as clear as water from a mountain spring. There is no lack of clarity or doubt. And that she clearly felt that this decision was right. She held fast to these thoughts and put everything into God's hands, no matter what the outcome might be. In spite of her modest income, the bank gave her the approval for the mortgage. She joyfully told her family about it and got an even better offer from them to financing the house, and she happily accepted it. Then the seller's niece got into the picture and told her on the phone that the selling price had just raised since there were now other potential buyers. Hmm. Everything had seemed to be working out so well, and now this. My friend was at first disappointed and inclined to get upset and angry about the niece, but began immediately to put everything under God's control and to refuse to indulge in anger and wrath. She held consciously to this absolute idea that both the niece and herself were the perfect image and likeness of God. When she felt freer and lighter again, she came to the decision that she would only be willing to pay the original price. So she, so she informed the seller of the house about her decision. She held on also to this passage from Science and Health. Spirit God gathers unformed thoughts into their proper channels and unfolds these thoughts even as he opens the petal of a holy purpose in order that the purpose may appear. And this helped her greatly not to let herself get aggravated, but to let God unfold this plan for a right place for her. A few days later, she got a phone call from the niece who told, who told her that her aunt wanted to want her to have the house at this original price. And so she bought it. And do you know what happened then? During this busy period, my friend had an appointment with an optician, but I didn't know anything about it. She told me that for 16 years she had suffered from limited peripheral vision and short-sightedness. And the eye doctor had told her that this condition would never change. She needed special glasses for the problem with peripheral vision and there was only one optician in Hamburg that could make them, so they were extremely expensive. At this appointment, the optician determined to his great astonishment that she no longer needed these special glasses because the peripheral vision was normal. My friend was so surprised that she couldn't believe it first and asked him honestly if he was totally sure. So he checked her eyes again and confirmed the finding. To his amazement, the thought shyness had also greatly improved. What a joy to her. Healing was taking place everywhere. I was even happier because she had not told me about the eye problem. But our trust in God, unfold of his purpose, healed her. Let's sum this all up. All of you here have an infinite, loving, unconditional support, a firm foundation. Father, Mother God sustains us all 
nourishes us all, loves us all. You are infinitely loved. Ultimately, you exist only because that is the meaning of the whole creation, the spiritual creation, where God governs, where love governs. Begin to accept, agree with it, feel and see it. It means that first and foremost, it's all about cultivating the consciousness of God's presence. We are not far away from it. It's always there. That must be our very first concern and goal, to see the nearness of infinite good and to be conscious of its presence. Abundance, wealth of ideas, whatever the need is, is a fruit of this spiritual perception. Then, in a way, it falls into our lap. That means that our search is not focused on a job, money, health, but solely on reaching a more spiritual state of consciousness, a consciousness of infinite abundance, love, divine guidance, and wholeness. You might think, I can't do that. This is only for a few chosen ones. Of course you can. Everyone can do that. We are all the infinite divine idea of God. That is our spiritual identity and individuality. That is why we all have this ability. That's beyond any question. In order to really experience the abundance, the wealth of God, it is a crucial point that we shift our sense of values from a material to a spiritual basis. This is the meaning of Jesus saying in the Sermon of the Mount that I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. It's so much easier. When we seek this kingdom first, or to put it in another way, when we acknowledge that as the expression of the divine principle, which is God, we are spiritually complete and perfect. We experience abundance or as something that is not material. Abundance becomes more a life without limitations with plenty of joy, with full possibilities for development of the Christ-like fruits of the Spirit. Love, peace, goodness, gentleness. And the consciousness of abundance as the expression of God good certainly appears in a way that meets every human need. I think it is the most wonderful feeling there is to know that only is really that we are never separate from God and that through this unity, the being at one, everyone can feel the divine love. Mary Baker Eddy expressed it in this way when she asked, what is the best way to bring about an instantaneous healing? She said, that is to love, to be love, and to live love. There is nothing but love. Love is the secret of all healing, the love that which forgets itself. But it is not a love for a person, nor for anything. It is love itself. Sometimes when you think you've been rejected or are unloved or have been treated unjustly, give yourself a mental hug and tell yourself, I am the loved of divine love. I know that God loves me, not because of something I've done, but because he sees me the way he created me, perfect, pure, good, and satisfied. Right at this moment and for all eternity, I live in the consciousness of love because he created me as his image and likeness. I am loved and I am lovable. 
and I'm loving, this helps. And this illustrates an important point in Christian science healing. As the loved expression of God, we aren't moving towards perfection, we start from perfection. Our starting point is the fact that God's man, the true spiritual identity of all of us here includes all completedness. Begin to think in terms of infinity. Don't let any limiting thoughts into your consciousness. Know that there is only infinity, infinite ideas. And these infinite ideas belong to you and everyone. I hope you've become a little more aware today that you are precious, unique, and loved. And that in reality, you live in superabundance. Prove it to yourself that complete supply and love, yes, even the resulting superabundance is possible. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>